for not being able to speak Spanish, and to, I want to thank the translator most warmly. When Rogier van der Weyden was born in Tournai in 1399 or 1400, all books were manuscripts, written by hand, like the copy of Livy in the exhibition. A splendid volume expected to last, it is written on parchment, that is animal skin, rather than the less durable paper which was becoming more widespread for cheaper volumes. Written in Florence in 1476, this luxuriously illuminated manuscript appears in the exhibition because of the two portrait randals in the border at the top of the page. Here they are below versions of portraits originated by van der Weyden. The Patrimonio Nacional's Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy on the left, and his son and successor, Charles the Bold, in Berlin on the right. Um, as the slides go past, if no location label appears beside a work, it is either in the exhibition or in the permanent collection of the Prado. As you can see, the Florentine illuminator had access to portraits by van der Weyden or his workshop. By the time van der Weyden died in Brussels in 1464, printed books had been available since the mid-1450s. This life of St. Lidwina of Skidam in the northern Netherlands was printed on paper with woodcut illustrations, which in some copies were hand-colored. Also added by hand in this copy are the little strokes of red that help to pick out. Sorry. The little strokes of red that help to pick out the initial letters to make it easier to find your way around the densely printed text. In the woodcut, her life of suffering begins as she falls while skating. Readers may have been expected to recognize the connection with van der Weyden, which I'm sure you have all already made, since Lidwina's fall echoes that of the Virgin in the Great Descent from the Cross, a visual embodiment of Lidwina's prayers to be privileged with physical pain so that she could participate in the Virgin's suffering. Lidwina's life, Lidwina's life was published in 1498. The first printing presses were set up in the Netherlands around 1473. Before van der Weyden died in 1464, he probably saw imported printed books, but their numbers were tiny compared to the legacy and continuing production of manuscripts. When books appear in his paintings, here the triptych of the seven sacraments, they can, therefore, be assumed to be manuscripts and, from their appearance and devotional context, to be written on parchment. The 13 volumes used or held by the worshippers in the triptych reflect contemporary reality, as the written word was, and of course still is, fundamental to the doctrine and practice of the church. Here are some of the books, starting with the celebrations of the Mass at the rude screen altar and the high altar visible just beyond the rude screen altar, the high altar just beyond. The elaborate and changing rituals of the church could not be memorized in their entirety. The missals with their essential texts for the Mass are propped open on the two altars so that the priests can easily refer to them. More elaborate celebrations required subsidiary texts and further volumes. If we extend the detail from the high altar, we see through the rood screen to a deacon reading the gospel or epistle from a large volume on an eagle lectern. Incidentally, such lecterns were one of the Southern Netherlands prestige products that were widely exported, including, of course, to Spain. From the book's size, it is probably not a complete Bible, but a lectionary containing the texts for the lessons to be read through the church year. Although such books would be put away once the service was finished, other volumes were often made available for anyone to use 
particularly complete Bibles and breviaries, which contain the offices to be recited at the liturgical hours of the day. On the other side of the high altar, a layman turns the pages of the book of a book contained in a cage, and he is just seen between the pillars there. As valuable items, books needed protection from theft. Chaining books was perhaps a more common solution, adopted in communal libraries as well as in churches. The cage had the advantage of making it more difficult to cut out leaves or illustrations. Um, vandalism is not just a modern phenomenon. These public books show that it was not just the clergy who were expected to be able to read. Levels of literacy were high in the prosperous urbanized Netherlands. By the mid-16th century, a Portuguese visitor noted that even in villages, even women could read. Schools were widespread, and it is likely that all the children who have just been confirmed in the left wing are attending school. The older boy holds a book, and the younger boy has an ink pot and pen case slung from his belt. <laughs> Literacy and numeracy were desirable for clerics, lawyers, and civil servants, but also for craftsmen and merchants, and not just craftsmen. Many women, including van der Weyden's wife, were involved in family businesses. Furthermore, literacy was, of course, a valued tool for the salvation of the soul. The responsibility of the individual to seek salvation through active participation in the sacraments and in communal church services, as well as in private prayer and meditation, was central to the devotio moderna, the modern devotion. This popular religious movement spread from the northern to the southern Netherlands from the late 14th century and was centered on the lay communities of the brethren and sisters of the common life and also on the houses of the Augustinian canons of the Windesheim congregation and the houses of male and female Franciscan tertiaries. Many of these communities were involved in book production in both Latin and Dutch to generate revenue and also to ensure a supply of accurate texts of worthy, of worthy um, authorities. The brethren and sisters of the common life, in addition, frequently supported themselves by running schools and school hostels. The rituals of the church, such as the mass at the altar at the back of the left wing, remained in Latin, but Bibles, books of ours, the simplified offices for the laity, primarily the office of the Virgin, and other devotional texts were also made available in Dutch. Literacy gave, indivi gave the individual direct access to the essential texts, increasingly available translated into the vernacular. To imitate Christ, to borrow the title of one of the movement's key texts, the Imitatio Christi, required the study of the Bible and of works of spiritual guidance, in addition to informed participation in the liturgy. Two of the congregation are following the service in their own books. The couple at the back of the center panel also have their own books. They're just along from the man with the caged book, um, just between the pillars there. Uh, this couple also have their own books. The piety of the people attracted the attention of an Italian traveling through Germany to the Netherlands in the early 16th century. He was clearly surprised that they did not talk in church, and f but followed the services and joined in the prayers. And, of course, books were necessary for them to do this. Here, the man's book is closed as he concentrates on the mass at the high altar. The lady's is held open, protected carefully by the cloth incorporated into the binding. Such protective bindings were very popular, and one can be seen in more detail at the front of the right panel, 
held by the woman attendant on the deathbed. Um, she would be reading suitable um, prayers, devotional texts, perhaps out loud or perhaps just silently to support the dying man with her devotions. Even in this, the largest depiction of a book in the triptych, only the colored initial letters are visible, are, are legible. Uh, see them there and there. The rest suggests the appearance of writing while being illegible. The text is therefore undefined. Other details are meticulously conveyed down to the stitches attaching the cloth, um, usually known as a chemise in describing these bindings, um, attaching the chemise to the binding. There are all the little stitches. Folded round the book, the chemise would have protected the gilded page eddings, edges and their stamped pattern. Um, this pattern here created by punching onto the gilded edges of the pages. Chemises were liable to become worn, even if themselves protected by bags when the book was not in use and also very inconvenient for the way books were stored in subsequent centuries. This means that few chemise bindings have actually survived, but the reality of what Van, Van der Weyden shows can be assessed against depictions by other artists and descriptions in inventories and accounts, as well as by the few survivors. This exceptionally luxurious chemise binding was preserved as part of a prestigious and important agreement made in 1504 between King Henry VII of England and the Royal Abbey of Westminster. It gives some idea of how money could be lavished on the protection of a book. The two wooden boards that make up the front and back covers, you can see the outline of one there, the two wooden boards are covered by crimson silk velvet, and remember this is a time when silk is very expensive. They're covered by crimson silk velvet lined with pink and gold silk damask, originally, of course, with a silk and gold tassel at each corner, not just the one remaining. The five bosses, the metal projections here, and I will return to them and their purpose, are enameled with the king's arms. The book is fastened shut with two straps, here and here, um, with plaited golden ribbons for pulling the rings of the straps over the pins set into the wooden boards. This would help you pull the ring over the pin and secure the book closed. Van der Weyden's chemise bindings are much more modest, although with some fine embellishments. This Mary Magdalene, now in the National Gallery in London, is one of the surviving fragments from a lost altarpiece. Her book with its chemise binding is somewhat grander than that held by the later, clearly related figure in the sacrament's triptych. The white stitching here is deliberately unobtrusive, but has been carefully detailed, stitching the chemise to the binding. In addition to the gilded page edges, a gold or gilt bar has been positioned at the top of the spine to hold the bookmarks. Those little threads are the bookmarks that then run down between the pages. Such accessories are fairly frequent in written records and in other images, but very few have survived. A similar device of uncertain date was preserved with the Imhoff prayer book, written in Antwerp in 1511 and now in a private collection. The tasseled bookmarks hang from the little cylinder at the top of the spine. And the cylinder is not attached to the volume, but held in place simply by the bookmarks between the pages. The whole can easily be removed and placed in another book. The Imhoff prayer book is still in its contemporary velvet binding with silver mountings for the clasps. The Magdalene's book has elaborate clasps in gold or possibly silver gilt with a pounce design on the inner surface 
seen on the clasp that has fallen back here, this pants design. Well, on the outer surface, there is a little statue, presumably of a saint, under a Gothic canopy. The book's accessories are conveyed with great skill. The impression of detail created through meticulously placed brush strokes, suggesting shapes and volumes chiefly through highlights here. The substance of the, of the book, that is its text, is even more illusory. Again, only the large colored initials are legible. It is, however, very plausible. If we turn it round, it can be compared to a roughly contemporary book shown on the left, a Bible written in Zwolle in the Northern Netherlands in 1451. Both have wide margins, two columns of text, red headings, and red and blue patterned initials. Red and blue were the standard colors for embellishing text, not just for ornament, but to help the reader find his way around by color rather than by spacing, the system eventually developed for printed books. We find our way around a book by looking for empty spaces at the end of a chapter or around a heading printed in a larger, more spacious type. Van der Weyden and his contemporaries would have looked for color. The actual book is a little grander than the one van der Weyden painted, as the initials have been filled in with red and blue decoration, which then continues down the margins to create decorative borders. Even so, neither book approaches the sumptuousness of the exhibited Livy. The simplicity of van der Weyden's books is again something I will return to. Although illegible, the Magdalene's book is completely plausible. With its long sections of continuous text, it is not obviously a prayer book, but evokes a Bible or some other appropriate devotional text. It does not matter exactly what the Magdalene reads in this context. The act of reading sends the message of piety. This is the Magdalene, the symbol of the contemplative life, who sat at the feet of Christ to listen to his words while her sister Martha toiled. Of course, van der Weyden did sometimes include legible texts in his paintings, but not as his works survive on open books. Instead, he used scrolls, as in the Sacraments triptych or the Miraflores triptych, of which you see the center panel with the angel's scroll explaining that the Virgin receives a crown of life because she was most faithful during the suffering of Christ. Um, the woman was most faithful. You can perhaps make out Mulier hec fuit fidelissima in Christi dolore, in the sorrow of Christ, um, and ending with a reference to the apocalypse, apoc revelations, um, clearly legible, meant to be legible, directing us in a particular way. Not represented in the exhibition is van der Weyden's use of inscriptions beautifully lettered directly onto the painting. In the Great Last Judgment at Bone, datable between 1443 and 1451, Christ invites the blessed to join him in the kingdom prepared from the beginning of the world in an inscription written in white letters that naturally read from left to right up here um, under the lily of mercy to arrive at Christ himself. And below, you see the end of this inscription. There's the lily of mercy. Um, and we have Mundi of the world um, as this inscription arrives at its destination of Christ. On the other side, Christ banishes the damned with discedite, depart, in a red inscription under the sword of judgment that progresses from left to right with the natural direction of the written word. And so, takes us with the damned as we read it away from Christ and down towards hell. The subtlety of van der Weyden's use of inscriptions in the written word suggests that he was literate and familiar with books. 
It may have been usual for the children of craftsmen, van der Weyden was a cutler's son, to learn basic skills of literacy and numeracy before starting an apprenticeship. Alternatively, reading and writing could have been part of the master's responsibility, as is reported to have been the case for two apprentice painters in Ghent in the 15th century. The adult van der Weyden certainly mixed in learned circles. He supported his son Cornelis through Leuven University and into the contemplative Carthusian order, and the assertively learned humanist scholar Cardinal Jean Jouffroy claimed him as a friend. Van der Weyden himself worked in a book on at least one occasion, around 1446 to 47, painting the miniature showing the presentation of the work in the first volume of the Chronicles of Hainault. The patron was Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy, who commissioned a series of splendid books for his personal library to instruct and entertain. The coats of arms of his dominions form the border decoration, and he himself receives the book surrounded by his courtiers. Since manuscripts were written and decorated before they were bound, van der Weyden had to invent the book's likely appearance when he painted this miniature of its presentation. Two hands are needed to hold it up, not just for its size, but its weight, the parchment leaves and the heavy wooden boards of the binding, which are covered with stamped brown leather and further weighed down by five metal bosses on each side, and also there are two straps with metal attachments. They have plaited ties for pulling them over the pins, um, just like the ones on the chemise binding of Henry VII. A subsequent inventory description of 1504 reveals that van der Weyden was right about the five bosses and the two fasteners, but wrong to show the leather. The visible binding was figured black satin, although there may well have been leather underneath. There are leathered covered wooden boards under the linen textile of this binding on the right. Made for Louis of Grootuza, whose prominent career at the Burgundian court was just beginning in the 1440s, it shows how closely van der Weyden was following the appearance of contemporary books. Um, you can see the correspondences in the bosses, the straps, and probably there were similar ties on the straps of the Grootuza book to help with its closing. Um, we have the Grootuza arms on these straps here. Straps or clasps were necessary because bindings were made for books to fall open easily. Pressure was required to keep them closed, whereas a modern binding is designed to stay closed and requires pressure to hold it open. The pressure of the clasps and the weight of the wooden boards had the further advantage of keeping the parchment from cockling with changes in temperature and humidity. The metal bosses were to protect the book when put away. Since books were not kept upright, but stacked flat, one on top of another. These books, in the enunciation associated with van der Weyden's master, Robert Campin, have not been put away very carefully. All should lie flat, like the volumes on the second shelf here, or this one at the bottom here. That is the proper way to keep a book. The bosses will then protect the bindings from rubbing against each other. Despite this careless shelving, the value of these books is recognized by the cupboard's lock and bunch of keys to prevent any unauthorized use. The importance of books also underlies the presentation miniature itself. Such ceremonies did take place, although again the artist has to anticipate in his visualization because the miniature of the presentation has to be ready for the presentation. Just as the imagined book is based on the knowledge of real books, so van der Weyden based an imaginary grouping of people on his knowledge of their actual appearances. The Duke, Philip the Good, his son, Charles the Bold, his Chancellor, Nicolas Rollin, 
Jean Chevreau, the Bishop of Tournai, are all recognizable from other portraits by or after van der Weyden. Jean Chevreau was also the patron of the sacraments triptych, where he appears in his pontifical vestments as the bishop administering confirmation. Painted around 1450, his portrait in the triptych seems based on the same drawing as that in the presentation miniature. For the more public and formal image of the triptych, Chevreau's head has been lengthened and so ennobled as he inclines towards the children. Yet the delineation of the features is virtually identical, particularly evident in the shifting viewpoints that result in the midpoint of the lips being to our left of the midpoint of the nose, something common to both portraits. Van der Weyden was able to use the same patterns for manuscript illumination as for panel painting. Unsurprisingly, those who were primarily manuscript illuminators also borrowed from his patterns for panel paintings. In the Book of Hours of Joanna of Castile, made on or after her marriage in 1496 to Philip, the first Habsburg Duke of Burgundy. Joanna is shown with an open prayer book, presumably her book of hours itself, with her patron saint, John the Evangelist, opposite a miniature of the Virgin and Child. Um, the text is a prayer to the Virgin, very appropriately. This miniature of the Virgin and Child could reproduce a painting actually owned by Joanna, since it is one of the half-length adaptations from van der Weyden's St. Luke painting the Virgin that proved enormously popular around 1500. Many versions of it are known. The illuminator may have been specially requested to include the picture, possibly even as a known invention of the famous Master Roger to be included in the princess's prayer book, or he may simply have used it as an appealing and available composition. Such borrowings by illuminators were not restricted to the Netherlands and Florence, remembering the Livy with which I opened. The earliest copy of the Duran Virgin, with a definite date, is this miniature in a French book of ours written in 1455. You will find the earliest datable copy um, illustrated in the exhibition catalogue. It is in another French book of ours of the 1450s. Intriguingly, the illuminator shows the Virgin under a circular canopy of the sort initially placed above her in the Prado picture, but not carried out in the final painting. Um, underneath, there is a canopy a bit similar to that one. It is just possible that the miniature may reflect an earlier stage of the composition that circulated as a completed painting or as a copy drawing. Alternatively, of course, the illuminator was simply inventing around the figure of the Virgin and Child. These lavishly illuminated manuscripts with miniatures, large initial letters, and fully decorated borders gleaming with gold and sumptuous with expensive pigments, and perhaps originally bound in precious textiles further adorned with gold and gemstones, are in marked contrast to the books depicted by van der Weyden. Of course, the Duran Virgin herself holds a book, bound simply in leather, with one clasp, perhaps of brass. The edges of the pages look to have been painted rather than gilded. Um, this does not seem to be imitating the glitter of gold, but rather just a painting of the book edges to decorate them, um, obviously something cheaper and simpler. The text has the minimum of decoration to make it easy to follow. There are headings in red, um, which you can see there. Um, and undecorated initial letters in red or blue, not even in red and blue, it's red or blue. Not follow the fictive text. Once again, it is only the initial letters that are legible. A similarly serviceable volume is shown with the Virgin in the Miraflores triptych. Although this one has two straps instead of the single clasp, 
and it also has bookmarks. And I'm sorry, this is not a very well-defined um, image, but I hope you can make it out. There are the two class, two straps, and there is the attachment with the bookmarks. And one of the bookmarks attached to this bar has fallen out, and we can see its red bead and green tasseled end. Um, and in that, of course, it is very similar to the bookmark arrangement, both of the London Magdalene and then particularly for the tassels of the Imhoff prayer book. Van der Weyden uses the book obviously to suggest the, the piety of the Virgin that reading is, is the suitable occupation as she grieves over the dead Christ. Um, but he also uses it to reinforce the sudden interruption of the Virgin's grief by Christ's joyous appearance. In her surprise, she has hurriedly shut her book, catching one of the straps between the leaves. The leaves already turned have relaxed and so also stop the book from closing neatly. There's the strap, but then these already turned leaves are not going to lie tightly together again. Whereas the leaves not yet turned are still compacted from the pressure of the previously fastened binding and the lower part of the book remains in a neater block, closer to our expectation of a modern prayer book. Um, the book sort of encapsulates this moment of dramatic change as the resurrected Christ appears. Even in such a small detail, van der Weyden uses his knowledge and experience of actual books to underline the central theme of his painting. Depicted books are not all as plain as those in van der Weyden's works. This is the book held by the Virgin in one of the 12 panels of the Ghent altarpiece, begun by Hubert van Eyck and completed by his brother Jan in 1432. We cannot see the illumination within the book to know how grand it is, but one imagines very grand, as on the outside the book has an elaborate green chemise edged thickly with gold. The red silk pom-poms at the corners have gold finials, and from them hang gold letter M's for Maria, um, like Groot Hooser with his coat of arms on the clasps. Um, the Virgin's book is identifiably hers. The pearl-studded roundel at the spine is the head of a pin um, used as an alternative way of fastening bookmarks. The bookmarks will be attached to the pin going down the spine of the volume. The Virgin sits at the right hand of God. At his left hand in the altarpiece is John the Baptist. His book has a simpler binding, but he too has a pearl top pin for bookmarks visible there, and more pearls adorn the ties on the straps. One has got caught within the pages there, and the other one is dangling down from his knee there. The text has initials in the conventional red and blue, and also a large initial on a ground of burnished gold grander than anything we've yet seen outside the Livy, in a 13th century style. If we turn the detail, it is easier to see that the decoration of the initial C includes legible letters to form consolamini, allowing for the abbreviation mark over the final I. That stroke over the I indicates that we need to supply some more letters. Consolamini is the opening word of Isaiah chapter 40, be comforted, which continues with the prophecy fulfilled by John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the desert, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The book is used to emphasize the Baptist's role as the precursor of Christ, legible text conveying a specific meaning. Although there are some identifiable letters in the rest of the text, there are no intelligible words to be discerned. It certainly does not continue with the text of Isaiah. The same is true of the book, probably intended for a book of ours, that Jan van Eyck painted before Chancellor Nicolas Rollin in the picture now in Paris. 
It is only slightly less sumptuous than the books held in the Court of Heaven in the Ghent altarpiece, and I'm sorry the slide is not really doing it justice. With a tasseled chemise here laid out to support the book on the prix dieu and with a pearl-studded pin for bookmarks again, with an initial letter on burnished gold, and I'm afraid difficult to see, but it is there, a fully decorated border running for the length of the text. This is the sort of luxurious book that Roland could be expected to own, to match his fabulously expensive cloth of gold robe. While costly books of ours could be valued as status symbols, they also expressed honor to the object of the owner's devotions. In 1395, a Tuscan merchant's wife was castigated for having a poor binding on her book of ours, while she splendidly adorned her own person. She was reproved, you see every day that men are ashamed to keep even their worldly books in worn out bindings. What should we not do for things belonging to the mother of God? Yet when van der Weyden painted Nicolas Rollin and his wife as the patrons of the bone last judgment on the exterior of the wings, he gave them much simpler books to assist their devotions. Resembling his other depicted books, these would seem to be van der Weyden's choice rather than the Rollins. Chancellor Rollins' book is certainly not cheap, with its gilded and punched page edges, gold clasps, and gold stitch chemise binding of silk damask. It does not, however, approach the splendors of the book given him by Jan van Eyck. The text decoration is limited to very simple uh, initials in blue and red, with smaller initials in blue or red. Um, there are the blue and red, and then you get smaller ones in just one color. And then there are also a few blue and red decorative line fillers, um, where the text was to start on a new line. The empty space would be filled in with a little area of decoration there and there. These indicate a text divided into short sections appropriate for a prayer book. The two columns are typical of van der Weyden's books, but are not common for books of ours, which are usually written in one column. Books of ours are the usual prayer books for the laity, but the two columns here suggest that the volume is the much longer and more complicated breviary, the complete sequence of offices that the clergy were obliged to say through the year, and that was also followed by some lay people. In fact, so complicated that this would probably be only one volume of a two-volume set. Roland's wife, Guigon de Salin, has a matching volume, although she does have more elaborately punched page edges. Um, it is not open to the same page, but we can again assume it is a breviary. Um, van der Weyden's books are simpler than Van Eyck's, but possibly as breviaries, more demanding in devotional terms. We see Guigon de Salin's book from the other side, so that at the front are the catches to for the clasps that are now at the back of the book. There are the, the catches. It also has the appearance of a breviary, but only the appearance, as, like her husband's, the bulk of the text is illegible. Even though no individual letters in black can be discerned, van der Weyden conveys the appearance of a specific kind of writing, recognizably a more cursive, lower level of script than van Eyck's, just as the decoration is at a lower level. The fictive script in van Eyck books, whether Rollins or, as seen here, the Ghent John the Baptists, um, we're looking here, suggests the shapes of individual letters by rising or falling strokes added to two horizontal tram lines. Um, you can see this sort of sense of the two horizontal lines and then strokes coming across them, rising above them for the tall letters, going below them for the trailing letters, and then some recognizable initial letters touched with red again, like the printed book we saw at the beginning. 
the illusion of text is completed by the small brush strokes added to suggest the abbreviation marks. In Gigon de Salin's book, seen below as elsewhere, van der Weyden conveys a different effect, that of a more fluent, joined-up script, by adding much simpler cross-strokes to the two horizontals. See, we've got the two horizontals much more clearly laid in, and then these simple cross-strokes. And then, and then dragging the wet paint to suggest the letters with ascenders and descenders. He's dragging the paint across the lines to create long letters, tall letters, um, in this very abstracted notional manner. Usually, it is van der Weyden's incredibly meticulous descriptions of detail that continue to work at high levels of enlargement, as, of course, the, the slides I've been showing reveal and the audiovisual show at the end of the exhibition. It's van der Weyden's meticulous descriptions of detail that can take this sort of enlargement, while van Eyck's seemingly meticulous detail dissolves into a web of brushstrokes of incredible skill. For fictive texts, their approaches are intriguingly reversed, a result of their different intentions. Turning the Baptist book, we can see that the effect is of a very formal Gothic script, of the kind developed in the 13th century and still current in the 15th century, seen on the left in a lectionary from Mons dated 1269. In the real book, each letter is formed by several separate pen strokes. Um, this is a very slow script, often linking it to its neighbors to create the tram line effect. Van der Weyden, working to, with wet paint to get the feathering effect, creates the effect of a more cursive, more flowing script, where the pen is lifted less frequently from the page, as seen in the contemporary Bible from Zwolle on the left. The more fluent actions of the scribe, not having to lift his pen perhaps four or five times to complete a single letter, make this sort of script quicker and therefore cheaper to execute. Such writing could be accompanied by rich miniatures and illuminated borders and be contained in elaborate bindings. But the books depicted by van der Weyden all fall into a recognizable category. Um, recognizable from books in real life, with their quicker script, simple red and blue decoration, and, when not hidden by chemises, stamped leather bindings that are not cheap, but far from lavish. Such manuscripts are specially associated with the book production fostered by the followers of the Devotio Moderna. The Latin Bible on the left was written by the Brethren of the Common Life in Zwolle in 1451. The Bible in Dutch on the right, dated 1461, was written and bound in the House of Franciscan Tertiaries in Zeppelin in Limburg. Gert Kroeter, regarded as the founder of the modern devotion, was not averse to beauty in the service of the church. He thought it fitting that the Bible and liturgical books should be beautiful to honor God. Yet, we are told as though it were laudable, he himself did not desire beautiful volumes and used a worn breviary. The point is surely to demonstrate not just his detachment from personal possessions in general, but also an attitude to books in particular, that their content and not their form was what mattered, just as the repetition of prayers by rote gained from being done with intention and with a knowledge of their meaning. Simpler, cheaper books could be made in greater numbers and could be afforded by a wider range of people who would not be distracted by superfluous decoration. Van der Weyden would certainly have been familiar with such attitudes and may well have shared them. His generosity to the charter houses of Herner and of Skirt, culminating in the gift of the majestically austere crucifixion, shows his active support for the strict contemplative Carthusian order whose ethos had influenced Gert Grote. The books van der Weyden depicted are perhaps of the sort that he himself owned. If the skirt crucifixion shows that van der Weyden may have chosen to depict simple books because they conform to his own religious practice, 
It also demonstrates another possible aspect of their appeal, their simple shape. The grid of square folds that structures the crucifixion is one of the most dramatic and overt instances of van der Weyden's sense of geometry, his liking for clearly structured compositions which unify figures and settings through strong lines, horizontals, verticals, diagonals, straight lines predominantly here, but also, of course, curves. Rectangular books, their shapes uncluttered by too much embellishment, are easily accommodated within his compositions. Indeed, they can be important elements within them. The sketch of the lost painting presented by Philip the Good's Duchess Isabella of Portugal to Battaglia presents the skeleton of the composition, emphasizing the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines of the prix dieu with their books. They serve to reinforce the central triangle of the virgin and child and to link that triangle to the subordinate triangles of the Duchess and the near triangle of the Duke and his son. In the Duran Virgin, the book forms a central part of the composition, creating a series of quadrilateral shapes with the Christ child's arms and the Virgin's hand, so that we have these shapes being marked out and then we can move outward into the folds of the Virgin's drapery and find echoing lines in her angled head. Um, the book sets up the sort of system of, of integration. These tie the mother and child to the book and to each other and convey the relationship between them. But why, at a time when books were valued items to be carefully preserved, why does Christ crush the pages of the book? One answer again lies with shapes, that the crushed pages form part of a diagonal of areas of pattern, from the glimpse of the cloth of gold, to the rumpled shirt, to the crumpled pages, uh, to the curling hair and the falling veil. Van der Weyden is very restrained in his use of pattern, another reason for the simple pages of his open books. Van der Weyden's lines and shapes are always expressive, form serving content, content melded with form. What is his content here? The illegible text is in the two-column format appropriate to a Bible, but not, of course, restricted to a Bible. It seems impossible that the Virgin would show the Christ child an evil book that merited being um, semi-destroyed, being crumpled up. Is the artist presenting the child rather than the God, heedlessly ramp rumpling up pages of which he cannot know the significance? But he is the omniscient God, and furthermore, the, maid, the Virgin makes no move to check him. Instead, calmly, even gravely, she acquiesces in his behavior. As God, the Christ child was generally accepted to have been able to read and write. Indeed, St. Antoninus of Florence, who died in 1450, complained of painters who showed the Christ child learning his letters because he was not taught by man. In the lost altarpiece to which the fragment of the Magdalene reading belonged, van der Weyden showed the infant Christ actually writing in a book held up for him by St. John the Evangelist. The composition is partly preserved in this drawing now in Stockholm. The end of the evangelist's drapery and his exposed foot, feet, uh, match exactly the little bit of St. John left on the Magdalene fragment in London, and so we can connect these together. Also linked to the London Magdalene is a surviving painted fragment, the head probably of St. Joseph, which is now in the Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon, and that fits on above the London panel. Also in Lisbon is this head of a female saint, which probably belongs to this rather vague outline and empty space here that there would have been a kneeling or sitting female saint in this area between the bishop and St. John, uh, John the Baptist. 
Um, that this saint was lower than the others is clear from the level of the river behind her. Um, compared to St. Joseph's River, um, she needs to come down the painting and to kneel or sit. Within an interior reminiscent of that in the Lost Battaglia painting, the Virgin and Child were placed between two contrasting trios of saints. On our right, one kneeling or perhaps sitting between two standing saints. On, sorry, on our left, one kneeling or sitting between two standing saints. On our right, one standing between one kneeling and one sitting. Here, van der Weyden created a strong diagonal of books. Presumably all illegible, like the Magdalens, the only one to survive yet taking on more specific meanings by their context. First, that held out towards the viewer by John the Baptist, himself the fulfillment of prophecy and prophet, and then witness of Christ's coming. It's as if he holds out the book. Um, you know, we can see he testifies. The next book, held by John the Evangelist, whose gospel ho opens with the account of the incarnation as the word made flesh, to which the Baptist bore witness, is that in which the Christ child writes. Finally, the Magdalene's book shows us the continuing power and validity of the word as she sits, the symbol of the contemplative life, literally at the feet of Christ, serving him through her absorption in his eternal word. In this composition, we are surely being directed to think of the writing Christ child as the word incarnate, as he inscribes words in the book of the evangelist, whose gospel opens with, in the beginning was the word, and continues, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Is this Christ child also primarily to be thought of as the word made flesh, who supersedes all other words? Does he crumple up the pages of the book because in his presence they lose their significance? Or, if the volume is to be understood as an Old Testament, because the pages will only acquire their true meaning through his life, sacrificial death, and resurrection. Van der Weyden opens up possibilities of meaning. The object of the picture is surely to stimulate meditation from the virgin and child to the whole cycle of redemption. It is designed to provoke questions rather than to provide a, symbol, a single simple answer. He could have written legibly on the book's pages to direct us by a biblical or other text, as he did on the scroll in the Miraflores triptych, for instance. He chose not to. The book that is so realistic is obviously an illusion when we look more closely. Its text illegible and its unexpectedly crumpled pages demanding our attention and consideration. The details that are so real add up to an unreality in terms of the material world. A valuable book maltreated, a mother and child sitting like sculptures in a niche under a hovering angel. Yet if the figures are considered as a painting of a sculpted group, they only acquire different aspects of unreality. The tracery of the arch forms a shape apparently invented by van der Weyden that existed only in paint and was not executed in reality until long after his death. Other elements in the painting are difficult to imagine as sculpture since they would have challenged contemporary sculptural techniques and materials. Prominent among them are the crumpled pages almost at the center of the composition. As so beautifully explored in the exhibition's texts and catalogue, van der Weyden's images operate through correspondences with, with the material world, but they are not simply representations of it. His primary subject matter was spiritual, not material. The books in his works, so convincingly simulated, except for the essential element of their texts, offer one way of exploring his extraordinarily subtle and complex creations. In the exhibition, the Duran Virgin, with her book, is inevitably overshadowed by the magnetic power of the nearby descent from the cross. Yet the smaller work compels our attention by similar means. 
through deliberate contradictions and ambivalences, presented in superbly controlled and manipulative compositions, van der Weyden directs us through the material to the greater realities beyond. Thank you.